Hi everyone, my name is Katie Goulder and today I'm going to be talking to you about the chemical treatments on invasive Asian clams or Corbicula fluminea. So a bit of an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, it's just a bit of background on invasive Asian clams as well as their impacts, some different management strategies that are available, as well as deep diving into two different treatment options including physical and chemical, um, and finally looking at the future directions of research in this field. So a bit of background on invasive Asian clams. Um, they are native to East Asia as well as East Africa, um, and they arrived in the Western United States in roughly 1938. Um, this is most likely due to transoceanic ballast water exchange, as well as it immigrant importation as a food source. Asian clams have many natural characteristics that make them highly successful at proliferating once introduced to a new water body. This includes high fecundity, um, Asian clams are self-fertilizing as well as hermaphroditic. Um, so a single individual can produce roughly 570 larvae per day, which translates to roughly 68,000 larvae per year, and this is just for a single individual. They also grow very rapidly and reach, have an early sexual maturity um, at roughly three to six months. Um, Asian clams also exhibit physiological plasticity and are very tolerant to different temperatures as well as substrates and the food available in the water column. Um, and finally, they are associated with human activities and have rapid dispersal because of that. So as we can see from this map, um, this is the northwestern expansion of Asian clams throughout Massachusetts. Um, and I will point out that this is far above the 40 degree latitude line that was once thought to be the upper limit of their cold tolerance. So in terms of Asian clams uh, impact, Asian clams are suspension feeders with high filtration rates, um, and as such, they can act as ecosystem engineers to these invaded waterways. They directly compete with native unionids for food and space, reducing phytoplankton by as much as 70% and significantly altering macroinvertebrate communities. They also impair native unionid uh, freshwater reproduction directly by filtering sperm out of the water column um, or ingesting native glochidia. They induce abiotic changes by sequestering carbon in the water and producing high concentrations of toxic ammonia, either through their feces or during these mass die-off events. And finally, their burrowing in the substrate causes bioturbation, which can negatively impact native unionid filtration. While difficult to determine, it's estimated that one billion US dollars is spent annually across the United States um, in efforts to control and repair damages caused by Asian clams. The economic and ecological impacts are expected to rise due to climate change as Asian clams range continues their northernly expansion. And unlike zebra and quagga mussels that are highly publicized with rapid action plans in place upon detection, Asian clams are lesser known. They live at the bottom of water bodies, so they generally do not interfere uh, with other public recreation activities unlike other invasive plant species that may prevent swimming or boating. Raising awareness in the general public and in the natural managers management field may help to prevent spread and help initiate early detection and rapid response programs. So in terms of available management strategies, um, different management strategies are available for treating invasive species that include physical removal as well as chemical treatments, which will be the focus of my presentation today as well as biological controls and genetic control. Listed here are different site-specific variables that should be considered when determining the best treatment upon detection. I will primarily be speaking about the treatments used for natural open water systems. So in terms of treatment options, to focus a bit on the physical removal of these species, um, this is a list of the physical treatment options available to treat Asian clams that include gas impermeable barri benthic barriers, hand harvesting, suction dredging, water level drawdowns, and thermal controls. I will note that all of these methods listed are reactive strategies and all contain pros and cons that should be evaluated on a site-specific basis. For an example of a gas impermeable benthic barrier, we'll take a look at this case study in Lake Tahoe. Um, and using gas impermeable benthic barriers, basically it predicates on Asian clams relatively low oxygen tolerance. 
and it can be a highly effective strategy, but it is very resource intensive, as you can see from the image above. Um, and it treats only the adult life stages of Asian clams that have buried themselves in the substrate. It does not treat the larval stage that is free floating in the water column. Um, and it is not species specific and therefore can have negative impacts on native unionid species. So looking more towards the chemical treatment options that we have available, um, we performed a systematic review of literature currently available and categorized them based upon the species tested as well as the setting of the testing, either in lab or in field. And as you can see, the results show a clear discrepancy about where resources have been allocated and the knowledge gaps that persist on chemical treatments um, that are available to target Asian clams. So this is a subsect of one of the tables from our publication um, and examines the chemical toxicities that are found largely uh, based on a study by Rosa et al. from 2015 uh, that performed in-lab toxicity testing on six different chemical compounds on Asian clams. They tested under both normoxic conditions as well as under hypoxic conditions. And generally, the results found that under hypoxic conditions, lower concentrations of the chemical treatment was needed to achieve similar mortality rates. Um, and these results really has the potential for use in combining chemical treatments with physical treatments that reduce dissolved oxygen, such as the benthic barriers we discussed earlier. In terms of the chemical treatments that have been used to treat other invasive bivalves, uh, there are numerous studies available. So we tried to include um, a very representative sample of chemical treatments with the potential for use on Asian clams. Uh, these compounds include various copper-based molluscicides, as well as potassium chloride, microencapsulated compounds, and for a more quote-unquote natural option of essential oils. For the sake of time, I can't go into every compound here, um, but this is an example of a commercially available molluscicide under the brand name EarthTech QZ and its efficacy on quagga and zebra mussels. And money compounds already in use to treat invasive species uh, could be applied to Asian clams with further testing. So in terms of future directions, uh, while prevention would be the ideal strategy, um, how do we best protect waterways that Asian clams have already infiltrated and prepare for new waterways being invaded? So this review that we published uh, summarizes the current available research on the chemical treatments of invasive Asian clams to direct future research efforts and to help guide resource managers and practitioners on invasive Asian clam management. Um, further infield testing is needed to substantiate the toxicities that have been tested in the lab on Asian clams, as well as to test treatments that have been proven successful to treat other invasive bivalves to determine their efficacy on Asian clams. And finally, there is the potential to explore how to combine chemical and physical treatments to maximize their efficacy to eradicate Asian clams in infested waterways while minimizing the impacts on non-target species. If you would like to learn more about our research, um, our review article was published last month in a special issue of Animals on Alien and Pest Mollusks. And you can find the full extent of the tables and as well as the summarize the effective concentrations for various molluscicides currently available on the market. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank my supervisor and my co-author, uh, Dr. David Wong of MassDEP for his mentorship as well as his guidance throughout this process. Thank you so much for your attention.